blessed. Man, has it been a great month in church? I heard you guys had the prophet last Sunday night. Dr. Cirillo was in the house. How many received last week? And Philip LaCrue, and, and I know you guys have been having some church, and I'm so blessed. It, it feels so good to be home in my home church. This is my church. I love Victory Arch San Diego. I'm not going nowhere. And, you know, I get so encouraged to come to come to church and because, you know, they say this, they say sometimes that when, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Who've ever heard that saying before? But I, I'll reverse it. I say, when the cat's away, the mice will pray. And I'm so proud of you. I, I follow a lot of you on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm stalking you. No, it's good. And uh, to see how much teaching is going on in our church, in the life groups, in the women's Bible classes, in the marriage encounter, in the, in the homes. Come on, somebody. In the youth ministry. I got to tell you, man, if, if, if you die of malnutrition in this church, it's not because you're not getting fed. It's because you're not eating. Tell your neighbor, we got good food here. And I, I see you and I say, whoa, look at the people go. Look at them teach. Look at them building each other up. Look at them edifying one another. Look at them fellowshipping. Look at them together. This is a church that's a family. I, I, I'm proud to be a part of Victory Outreach San Diego. And it's encouraging to see that. But then also, it really is true when the cat's away, Y'all pray. Now, maybe a few of y'all are playing. But on the majority, you pray. In fact, Wednesday nights, there's a hunger for prayer in this place. And, and I, I'll tell you, when we, when we set out this year to, to declare a year to build, how many know that was a very critical and strategic theme? This wasn't a theme that we just thought up, you know, and, and that sounded good. But how many know we're, we're literally in building mode? We're, we're literally being intentional in, in everything we do in our church to be able to expand this ministry, this local church, into the next level, into the next dimension. And uh, that's why even in the next service, we're going to be hitting some walls again. We're going to hit some walls again. Stick around. It's going to be really good. And in fact, just by the end of this week, by the end of this week, we're going to tear down that sound booth. All that's going to go. And we're, we're already making moves. The contractor said, start tearing stuff up. Because it's a matter of time. We're pushing that wall back. Come on, somebody. We're pushing it back. And so keep on giving. Keep on being faithful. If you haven't been able to give towards your pledge yet, don't wait any longer. Start doing it now. Let's get, let's get those finances in. Praise the Lord. All right. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open them with me to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Matthew. You guys can go ahead and find your seat. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And I got a, a, a message in my heart for you today. I, I don't want to be long. I just feel that this is a message that every one of us need to hear for the season we are in. How many know God will bring you to seasons? And we're in a season of building. We're a season of expansion. We're in a season of growth. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning in verse 11, just two quick lines. It says this. It says, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Now, go on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, a lot of nines today, verse 24. And th this is Paul talking about striving for the crown, striving in the race. In verse 24, it says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? So in other words, if you're in the race, you can't walk. You got to run. Amen. It says, but only one receives the prize. 
He says, run in such a way that you might obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to attain a perishable crown, but we run for an imperishable crown. He said, therefore, I, I, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. He says, but I discipline my body. Somebody say discipline. <laughs> I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself might not be disqualified. This morning, I want to speak a message to you entitled Running with the Pack. Running with the pack. Give your neighbor a high five and you may be seated. Running with the pack. This is a strong pack this morning. Wow. This service is growing. I was telling Pastor Miller, I said, if, if, if the people of Victory Heights San Diego don't start filling up the chairs, I'm going to take the empty chairs and give them to Gary. Gary's like, all right, I'm going to hold you to that, Pastor. I know. That's, I, that's how I keep myself accountable. Can I hear an amen? I want to talk to you about running with the pack. Everybody say running with the pack. When you look at Paul the Apostle, you find that Paul the Apostle was a pace setter. And not only was he a pace setter, he was a finisher. What makes Paul stand out in the Bible in the midst of so many runners so many finishers is that Paul really had to overcome a lot of obstacles in his race, a lot of obstacles in his way, a lot of different things that tried to derail him from his assignment. And so Paul, in the end, he says, I have finished my race. I have run my course. I have been faithful to the heavenly calling. How many want to be faithful to your calling? So Paul was able to make that statement because he overcame many things and he kept on running the race with passion. Now, I want you to know that the race that you and I have been given is an important assignment from the Lord. Understand that every one of our race is an assignment from the Lord. And this assignment is is really not only determines our personal destiny. And, and this is the part I really want you to catch is this assignment we've been given is not just regarding our personal destiny, but this assignment we've been given could determine the destiny of others. We don't run just for ourselves. Say amen. We, we're running because not only is our destiny on the line, but quite possibly our family's destiny could be on the line. People who are watching us, their life could be on the line. So how many know we got to run the right way? I, I've learned this is that my bigger, my calling is bigger than me. My calling is bigger than me. It's my life on its own is feeble. My life on its own is weak. I don't have what it takes to run this race with effectiveness. And because my life is feeble and weak and my calling is so big, watch this. I cannot afford to run by myself. Oh, this is good stuff. Tell your neighbor, you can't run alone. Rudyard, Clip, Rudyard Kipling said this in The Law of the Jungle. He wrote the book, Jungle Book. How many of you read? <laughs> Rudyard Kipling said in The Law of the Jungle, he said, the strength of the pack is in the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is in the pack. Here's my question to you this morning. Are you running with the pack? Are you running with the pack? See, I want you to know that God's called you to be in the pack. You're a pace setter. You're a runner. You're a leader. Someone is watching you. People are watching us. People are watching me. People are watching you. We're all being watched. People are watching to see how we run. They want to see how we run. They want to see how we're living our life. They want to know if our walk matches our words. Is this good stuff this morning? They want to know if we're really operating according to the rules of the pack. Because how many know without the pack, we can't make it? The strength of the pack is in the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is in the pack. And that's why being a part of the pack, how many of you are a part of the pack? 
I know we call ourselves lions. So maybe I should say, how many of you are part of the breed? Yeah. Right? So the question is, is what's your mindset? How are you running? How are you moving? Are you understanding that your life matters? Now, I, I got to tell you that there are two great challenges in the church today. Two great challenges in the church. The, the, the first challenge is to get the sinner saved. The second challenge is to keep the saint focused. That's the challenge. That's what we do in the ministry. We're trying to get the sinner saved. We're trying to keep the saint focused. See, here at Victor Outreach, we want the sinners to be saved. How, how many believe the sinners are going to be saved? Yeah. Say, don't call them sinners. Why not? That's what they are. Because how many know sin brings death? Destruction. We want to get the sinners saved. And, and that's why we pray. That's why we serve. That's why we work so hard in the ministry. That the sinner would make a decision to come to Jesus. That's why we're doing what we're doing. We're not a, we're not a, a club of people. We, we, we have a mission. We have, we have a vision to reach the lost at any cost. That's why we give all these things. About 16 years ago, when we were constructed this sanctuary the very first time, we were believing for the lost. In fact, under the stage, I want to show you, under the stage, we have a, a bag like this. Right. And there's some papers in here. But the bag, some of you were here under this stage is filled with the names of our family members that we've been praying for. It's filled with the names of our co-workers and our friends and people that we know in the neighborhood that they need, they need Jesus to take control of their life. And, and I want to tell you something in just a few in, in just a matter of time. We're going to tear this stage up. We're going to redo this stage. And when we go down under the stage, we're going to see the bag. It's probably going to have a lot more dust on it and who knows what's going to be on it. But you're going to be surprised because we're going to pull the names out of the bag. And what you're going to find out is that when we pull those names out of that bag, some of your names were written on this piece of paper. Before you even thought of serving the Lord, we were already praying for you. When you were still wrapped up in your chaos and wrapped up in your drama, we were praying for you. We were believing for you. We were fasting for you. We were giving for you. We were paying a price for you. And look at you now. You're praising the Lord. You're married. You're in the ministry. God has raised you. We have some young people here that are answering the call. And, and 10 years ago, you were just a name on a piece of paper. But look what the Lord has done. What am I saying to you this morning is that somebody paid a price for you and I. None of us got here by ourselves, but somebody paid the price. Somebody sowed a seed. Somebody sacrificed. Somebody kept on serving. Somebody didn't give up. Someone ran like an example. Someone stood in the pack. When others are walking away, you pressed in stronger because there's a promise that God wants to bring to pass. We want to see those sinners saved. And you know what I believe is there's a new wave that God's going to raise up. There's a third wave. We talk about a third wave, but we can't have a third wave of ministry till we have a third wave of salvation. We can't have a third wave of ministry until all those chairs in the youth ministry are filled up and all those chairs in this sanctuary are filled up. Come on, somebody. Then we can have ministry when we get out into the highways and the hedges, get into the prisons, get into the neighborhood, get into the schools, get, in, get out there and let them know that Jesus is not dead, but Jesus is alive. We're not just about performing. We're not standing up here to put on a performance. We believe that Jesus is powerful. And we believe that Jesus is using our gifts to bring people to his throne, bring people to the cross, to let them know that he has a purpose and a plan for their life. Come on and give him a praise. That, that was powerful. Give him a praise this morning. Our first mission, man, is we've got to get the sinners saved. But you know what the, the second mission is this, is that we need to keep the saints focused. That's, that's, you say, what's pastoring, pastor? What's pastoring? What's pastoring about? I just told you. Get the sinner saved, keep the saints focused. <laughs> keep the saints focused on the mission. 
See, to do anything significant in this world, the, the saints have got to stay focused. The saints must be focused on the mission because unfocused saints actually weaken the mission. Unfocused saints weaken the mission of God. They weaken the church. See, I want you to know that Satan desires to weaken the saints. He desires to weaken people who at one time were on mission because Satan hates a church that does three things. And, and this is why Satan hates this church, because we do these three things. Satan hates a church that prays, hates a church that gives, and hates a church that evangelizes. Simple as that. Satan hates a church that does those three things. And Satan knows how to come against a church like that. Are you guys with me? He knows how to come against a church like that. But when he sees that a church doesn't buckle when he releases a full frontal assault on it, he moves to sly tactics. When he throws the hammer at you and sees that hammers don't move you and swords don't move you and he can throw the kitchen sink at you, you just pick it up and throw it back at him. Let me tell you something about this church. This is a tough church. We got people with heart in this place. We got people with commitment. We got people who know how to press through the fire and press through the storm. So when Satan sees that he can't stop you with a full frontal assault, he starts playing dirty. He starts using sly tactics. He says the frontal attack won't get him, so now I'm going to have to move with some slick distractions. If I can't get you to backslide, I'm going to try to get you off course. So what does he do? He starts to sow seeds of discord and disunity in disciples. In other words, he starts getting you mad at each other. Is this too real? Then he begins to divert leaders to selfish ambitions. He gets leaders to start saying, well, they don't appreciate me. They're not using me. Well, what are your motives? Is it to glorify you or for God to be glorified through you? Satan knows how to come in and get a, a saint off track. Get a saint diverted from his vision and from his original mission. He knows how to bring in those selfish ambitions. He, he knows how to bring so-called well-intending people to come and try to derail you. One of the first moves they say, are you happy? Does the pastor spend enough time with you? Does the power, maybe the pastor doesn't really know what he has in his presence. No, we know. We just know you're not ready. See, Satan wants to take leaders off track. Ooh, tell your neighbor, stay on track. He wants to weaken your worship and then weaken the preachers and take contrary voices to come in to get people to think that it's the grass is greener on the other side. If, if the enemy's been attacking you in slick ways, I first pray that you're wise enough to see it. But secondly, I pray that you understand that the grass is never greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. I, I'll tell you, I'll never leave this church. I, I'll never get tired of working with you. I'll never get tired, even though I see you day in and day out. And you see me day in and day out. And I know sometimes, I know sometimes that I get on your nerves. You don't have to, you know, the whole pastor. No, I know, I know I get on your nerves. I know sometimes you get tired of hearing my voice. But one thing I've learned is I'll never get tired of working with the people of passion. And I'll never get tired of working with the people of commitment. I, the reason I'll never leave this church is because you know what? I've got too much seed in the ground. And you know what? You've got seed in the ground too. And, and don't you want to see that seed sprout? 
I know we've done some great things in the past and God has been faithful in the past, but how many can't wait to see the next thing that God is going to do in this church? And I want to tell you the reason I can't leave this church and the reason I can't get distracted and I can't get too involved in other things because I believe that our best season is still ahead of us. We're going to see more people say, more families change, more leaders raised up, more churches planted. Come on, somebody. I can't wait to see what the Lord is about to do. I can't throw in the towel. I can't quit because I want to be a part of a move of God. Tell your neighbor, we're in a move of God. But you've got to be wise. That's why Paul said to the Galatians in the New Living Translation, he said to them, he said, you were running superbly who cut in on you, deflecting you from the true course of obedience. He goes on to tell them, this detour doesn't come from the one who called you into the race in the first place. This detour in your life, in other words, is not the Lord. It's not the Lord that called you into the race in the first place. And he says this, he says, and please don't toss this off as insignificant. He goes on to finalize by saying, it only takes a minute amount of yeast to permeate the entire loaf of bread. In other words, what Paul is saying is, number one, this diversion is not from the one that called you. And number two, it doesn't take much for your whole life to be affected by a small, minute interference. Ooh, this is heavy. It doesn't take much. I remember when Georgina and I were dating, her dad had this small boat. It wasn't that small, but it was a boat, a power boat. And he wanted to take us to Catalina Island. So we were young, and he threw us on the boat and said, let's go. About a three-hour trip out to Catalina. And about halfway through the trip, he got tired of driving. And he says, hey, you. He didn't even call me out. He said, hey, you. <laughs> hey, guy. You, guy, ugly guy, come here. All dads think their daughter's boyfriends are ugly. And, and he said, you want to drive? And I said, sure. So I got behind the, the, the power boat, and I started to drive. And he goes, this is what I need you to do. I'm going to rest, but I need you to focus on the compass. There was a big compass on the dash. He goes, I need you to keep the heading between 46 and 47. Now, if you see these compasses, some of the sailors may know, the, the lines on the compass are very small, millimeters apart. And he said, I need you to keep the heading of the boat between 46 and 47, because that's our heading. That's what's going to get us to Catalina. So I said, sure. Now, I don't know if you've ever driven a boat in the open ocean, but it's not easy. You got waves, you got currents, and I'm going in this boat. And the whole time I'm looking at the compass, 46 and 47, 46 and 47. <laughs> but on the boat, Georgina's there, her mom's there, other people are there, and they're all fellowshipping, and here I am, 46 and 47. <laughs> and then I also thought Georgina was cute, so I'm like trying to look at her <laughs> and get her attention and flirting with her while I'm trying to keep this boat straight. And so little by little, I'm kind of losing the strength and the ability to keep it between 46 and 47 on the compass. And I start to talk and start to do things. And I start to feel a little bit overconfident. Like I know what I'm doing. And you know what, I know how to do this thing, and I know how to steer my boat, and I know how to do all these things. About half an hour in, her dad comes up. He goes, let me check the cup. He goes, he said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're not between 46 and 47. He says, now you're between 47 and 48. 
which was just about a two millimeters over. I said, well, what's the big deal? He says, the big deal is that if you stay on this heading, we'll miss the island entirely. See, some of you think that little distractions don't have an effect on you. And some of you think that you know how to ride, drive your boat better than your pastor. Let me tell you something about the men of God in this front row. We've developed our sea legs. We've been in the storm. We've been in the battle. We've seen the good side of ministry. We've seen the ugly side of ministry. Don't think for a minute that you're going to get to your destiny without the direction of your leaders. you got to be careful. Tell your neighbor, be careful. See, God wants to bring you. Watch this. God wants to bring you into your port. <laughs> when it's time to, to dock, he doesn't want you to end up on the wrong port. God's trying to lead you into your port, healthy, wealthy, and wise. And he's giving you leaders, and he's giving you a church, and he's giving you a wolf pack, and he's giving you a lion's breed. He said, you need to learn to run with these people because these people are going to help you get to the place that God has called you to. All. How many are grateful for your church and grateful for your pack? You might not always like your pack. You might not always like the people around you, but you better believe that this is a church that is going somewhere. And if you keep on running and you keep on pressing and you keep on moving, the promises of God are going to come to pass. Touch your neighbor, tell him, stay in the pack. I'm almost done. There's a few reasons why Paul made it to the finish. First thing, number one, write this down. Paul ran with focus. Number two, Paul had a finisher's mindset, ran with the finisher's mindset. Number three, Paul ran with the right people. He ran with the right people, ran with focus. Someone say focus. Paul had his priorities right. He didn't allow anything to get him off track. No matter the opposition, he did not doubt his future. We may not know what the future holds, but how many know we know the one that holds the future? Also, Paul worked with all his heart. He, he was so focused, he gave everything he had to the vision of God in his life. He did everything to the best of his ability. I think that's the delineating line between success and failure is something called half-hearted commitment. Half-hearted people never lose, but they never win either. Half-hearted efforts lead to half-hearted responses, which ultimately lead to half-hearted results. In our leadership, in our church, we can't afford to be part-time spiritually. Because I mean, part-time Christians can't kill full-time devils. So we can't afford to slack off. We can't afford to take too many breaks. Yes, there's a time for rest. Yes, there's a time where you got to heal. Yes, there's a time we got to get some sleep. I, I feel like I need some sleep right now. Come on, somebody. But as soon as I wake up, I'm not coming with a half heart. I'm coming with everything that I've got. Because I'm running with a pack of people that their life depends on it. we we got to run with all our heart. We've got to give our all. We've got to be fully committed to the race. We've got to let it be known. I feel like we're in a season right now where we're, we got to let it be known. Because the Lord is, like they say in the neighborhood, he's looking and booking their waivers don't know about that. Their waivers don't know a lot of stuff. But how I many we got to teach them? Looking and booking. Who's with me, who's not? Who's praying, who's playing? And who's staying and who's going? Come on, somebody. See, if we're going to get to the place God's called us to go, we've got to declare ourselves and let it be known that we are fully committed to the race. Paul also ran with the finisher's mindset. 
Paul had a destination in mind. Do you have a destination in mind? Can you, can, you, can you ask God to show you the final result? See, Paul got that in prayer through discovery. He discovered his purpose in prayer. That's where, that's where it happens. It's not always what you see, but it's what you hear in prayer. And you, you got to get down in prayer and you got to pray and you've got to discover your purpose in prayer and you have to spend time with God. You got to fast. You got you to put on the sackcloth and the ashes. Come on, somebody. You got to separate yourself. You got to get alone with God so that you can hear his voice. Come on now. He shouts in our pain, but he whispers in our intimacy. And Paul got alone with God. He encountered God. He spent three years in the desert, three years in the desert, three years in the desert hearing from God. The Bible says he went into the third heavens, the third dimension. He had a revelation from God that was so heavy that God took a thorn and put it in his side just to keep him humble. And some of you, if you're going to really hear from God, you've, you've got to pray. You've got to discover it. Number two, you, you've got to decide. You've got to make a decision. Paul made a decision and he was going to run for God, with God and he was going to run with the vision God gave him for the rest of his life. Even if it meant that he had to re remove his past, release his past. And Paul did release his past. You know what he said? He said, forgetting those things that are behind. It's water under the bridge. Forgetting the hurt, forgetting the past, forgetting the pain, forgetting the brokenness, forgetting the sin, forgetting the old lifestyle, forgetting the old relationships and saying, I'm going to press towards the mark. I made a decision. I made a choice. I've heard from the Lord. Come on, somebody. And then Paul, he drove with passion. He said, forgetting those things that are behind. But now what am I going to do? Am I going to stand? Uh-uh. He says, I'm going to press. Just, just, that's what we need. We need people right now that aren't just going to give their finances. Money's not everything. Yes, we need the finances. Yes, we need them to come in. But God doesn't just want your money. He wants your commitment. He, he wants your pressing. He wants you to press with your gift and press with your talent and press with your presence. Come on, somebody. That's why I'm so encouraged. I came to a full church this, for a service. I said, oh, what an encouragement to see that the people are in the house of God on a Sunday morning. And they're not just coming here to give or not showing up, but they've been pressing. They've been praying. They've been getting a hold of God. Come on. Am I in the right church this morning? I'm, I'm excited about what's taking place. But tell your neighbor, you got to keep pressing. Paul, Paul pressed, was focused, was passionate, and pursued it. And as they come to the keyboard, lastly, Paul, he not only ran with a finisher's mindset, but lastly, he ran with the right people. He ran with the right people. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced of this because I've been doing the ministry a long time, is that you'll never get to the place God intended you to go being around the wrong people. Right people, right places, right result. Wrong people, wrong places, wrong result. Did you receive this word today? Do you still love me? You still love your pastor, love your church, love this vision, love this mission? Tell your neighbor, we got to run with the right people. We got to run with the pack. Paul knew who to stay close with if he was going to make it. Because there's three types of people in this world. Number one, there are the confused, the compromisers, and the quitters. Three types of runners. The confused runner, the compromising runner, and then the quitters. I think the fourth C would be the champions. But confused, a lot of young people these days are confused. You know, they have good intention, but they're not clear on what God has for them yet. They haven't spent enough time in the desert separating to God. And so be careful when you're running with people who are your own age, because chances are they might be more confused than you. The second group are the compromisers. Those are the weak runners. 
those are the runners that aren't in shape. You know, like, I, I couldn't run a marathon right now, guys. I just couldn't. I'm not in shape to do it. But spiritually, I'm in the best shape I've ever been. I'm sharp. <laughs> and compromisers allow sin to come in. And what sin does is sin weakens you. So when you're a compromiser, watch this, you can't keep pace with the pack. So that what happens is one of the wolves, the lead wolves, the head wolf, will send the, uh, a lesser lead wolf to go to the back of the pack and push you. And so you got a leader in the front of the pack, and then you got a leader in the back of the pack, and the second man is in the back and you're weak but he's telling you come on stay in the pack you let sin come in you let the devil deceive you but stay in the pack i'm being the second wolf for you right now i'm being the second wolf i'm coming behind you and telling you don't let the devil get the best you don't let the devil take you off track don't let the devil get you out of the pack don't let the enemy lie to you i'm coming behind you i'm kind of spanking you in the booty a little bit and saying you can do it god wants to bring you into port god wants to bring you into your destiny we've got a mission we've got a challenge we've got a work to do come on somebody and then there's the quitters and and those are the people paul couldn't deal with because John Mark was a quitter. And, and he got in a fight with Barnabas over John Mark because John Mark was Barnabas' nephew. But when they went on that first journey, he quit. And Paul knew what was ahead. He knew prison was ahead. He knew whips were ahead. He knew chains were ahead. And so when John Mark quit on him, he says I, he's not useful for ministry. Barnabas got upset, got hurt, rolled with John Mark. They went on a different mission. Paul said, I need a real soldier. He found a real soldier by the name of Silas. And y'all remember Silas. In the midnight hour, they were locked up in prison. But Silas didn't quit. The Bible said they started to worship the Lord. And the angel of the Lord showed up and they came out of prison. Why? Because they determined in their heart that they weren't going to let the devil get the best of them. God had given them a vision. God had given them a mission. I wonder if I got any Silas's in this room. I wonder if I got any Paul's in this room. I wonder if I got any true praisers, true worshipers in this room. Are there any runners that say, I'm going to run with the pack this year? Lift your hands all over this place. I want to tell you, we need everybody.